something just doesn't feel right. What am I talking about? I'm talking about my life, your life, everyone's life here in this sanctuary. What I'm talking about is there is something that we need to be aware of. And it is something that we need to aware, take aware of as soon as possible because it will get worse and dangerous if we leave it unchecked and undetected. It's like a cancer. If you don't know you have it, you don't worry about it. But when it comes out, it's devastating. What am I talking about? I'm talking about complacency. And then we're going to deal most specifically in spiritual complacency. Complacency is basically a smug or uncritical satisfaction for who you are and what your achievements are. So when you feel you're special or that you are good in something and then you take pride in it, that's complacency because we don't need to improve ourselves if we look at ourselves quite highly. Now, what did, why did I choose this topic? Because I can see in all of you, including myself, a life that takes God for granted, especially in the focusing on the Lordship of Christ. At some point in our life, we will come to a point wherein we feel that we are spiritually dry and complacent. While we start off with zeal, when, remember when you came to know Christ, how did you feel? You feel energetic, you feel excited, you feel zealous, that every time that you get a chance to read the Bible, you're so excited. Every time you come to church to sing praise songs, you look forward to it. But somehow it gets lost along the way. As a result, we all become lazy and cold. It's moments like this that is very discouraging for us because we feel like we're a million miles or more away from God. What's wrong is that we have this spiritual complacency in terms of His Lordship. So today, we would like to discuss the topic of spiritual com complacency, the reasons behind it, and as Christians, how do we bounce back from it? because we need to self-reflect. So if you want to get the benefit of this message, while I'm talking, you reflect on yourself. Take note of where your faith is. Probably our faith is hitting a plateau, doesn't go up, doesn't go down, but that's a wrong perception of faith. Probably you've not been consistent in your devotion as you have before. And then you have taken your eyes off of God because of the sins that you are committing. We are still sinful. We are saved. If we have Christ in us, that's true. That's a fact. That's what the Word of God says. But still, that doesn't stop us from sinning. And if we allow ourselves to sin and act complacency, we will take our eyes off of Jesus and dwell in the sin that we are looking forward to do. So, let's dig into the passage, and then we'll discover together what we need to do to stop being complacent and journey toward what God wants us to journey to. Next slide. Complacency is a deadly enemy to our spiritual growth. You know about this. Complacency is a deadly enemy to our spiritual growth. We have pastors who come here to tell us about this message. This message might sound familiar to all of you because probably I've preached it before or some other pastors have preached it before. But when the message ends, what do we do with it? We just put it in a pile of unremembered messages, forgotten sermons. We have a ton of forgotten sermons. Are you living, are we living our life for God right now? Or are we just squandering it away, doing useless things to entertain ourselves? How can we tell whether we're complacent or not? By being honest with yourself and ask yourself this question. I'm going to ask you a particular question. What you do is you try to remember the question I asked, and then you compare your life to the question. My question is, have we been living the way we should as believers of God Every time, every moment that we are awake. 
Have we been living the way we should as believers of God every moment that we're awake? And as you ask yourself those questions, compare yourself when you are in church on Sunday and the rest of the week. Is there a difference? Is there a difference in your behavior Sunday morning to the rest of the week? There is, right? On Sunday mornings, we put on our best smile, best behavior. If somebody offended us, we keep quiet. We try to bury it down until we leave church, then we rant out. Why is it that way? We live for, for ourselves one half day of the week. And we live for ourselves six and a half days of the week. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with me? Let's look at what Peter wrote, Paul, I mean, in Philippians while he was in prison. Verses, Philippians 3, verse 12 to 21. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to be taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what's ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and, eagerly, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Quite a long passage, right? But we're not going to dwell in everything in it. We'll just touch on key points. In this message, Paul was telling the Philippi believers to be very careful because there are a lot of false teachers going around them and teaching heresy. Now, this teaching is causing so much confusion to them that some of them even reverted back to who they were before they committed themselves to Christ. And this is something that Paul is telling them not to be complacent because it is very dangerous to be complacent in this situation. So in verse 14, if you'll take notice, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's tackle on the word press on. You, what Paul is saying, no matter what happens, no matter how much people criticize you, you press on with your faith. We all know this, that we need to have faith. As Christians, as believers of God, our faith should be strong and getting stronger as time goes by. But if we are not growing in our faith, we are not trusting God, we are not reading the Bible, we are not praying, chances are you are sliding away from the will of God. There's no such thing with regards to faith. There's no such thing as faith staying there. If we don't grow our faith, our complacency will grow. Faith doesn't stand still. Remember that. In our life, faith either goes up or uh, goes down. It does not stay where you left it. So the pressing situation here is if the Philippi believers take this for granted and become complacent in their spiritual life, they will slip back to the way they were. And we will do that also if we are complacent with our faith. Now, let's look again because really complacency is a deadly enemy to our spiritual growth. 
So in verse 18, verse 18, I should have a clicker here. For as I have forgotten, for often told you before and now, I tell you again, even with tears, many lives as enemies of the cross of Christ. Who are the enemies of the cross of Christ? For one, Paul is writing about the unbelievers. Paul is even talking about the people, the false teachers that, are, that is going around spreading heresy. But we can also be an enemy of the cross of Christ. I'll explain that more later. Now, this ver if I do not carry my cross, remember that, right? Christ tells us to bear our cross daily. And if I, even if I'm a pastor, even if I'm an elder, if I don't lift up my cross and put myself in the situation that Christ is in, I am also considered an enemy of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ means that we have to carry the cross, crucify your own flesh along with your passions and desires. And if God tells me to carry my own cross and I refuse to carry it, I am now branded an enemy of the cross of Christ. To be crucified with Him means denying myself and giving up my own will, my own lust, and my own desires. When you say, bear the cross, what comes into your mind? Your burden. You're sick, that's your cross. Financial problems, that's your cross. Fami family disagreement or feud, that's your cross. That's what we think. But we're wrong. The people in the first century, when you mention cross or they see a cross, it's not about hungry, sick, emotional in hurtness. When they see a cross, they see death. When Christ tells us to bear our cross, it's not to bear this, the situation you are in, but you are also bearing the cross and walking toward death. The death of your old self. The death of your sin. The death of your arrogance and pride in trying to control your own life rather than surrendering to God. That is the reason why we need to bear our cross. Yet we don't. There has to be something in your life that needs to be crucified. I know I have a lot of those that I need to do. What do we need to do to live for Christ? We need to bear our cross. And if we don't bear our cross, it will lead to complacency. Because we don't, know, we don't believe that we need to kill our old self. Because we enjoy our old self, face it. Wouldn't you rather be someplace else rather than here in church? Right? You could be in Tagaytay. I could be in Phil Invest. There's a car show today that I want to go. And it's not because I'm a pastor and I have a message to preach, but we need to love to be here. Buksunyu asked a while ago whether some of you here have prepared their clothes the day before. We were like that before. Oh, I'm going to wear this. I'm going to prepare myself. I'm so excited. Tomorrow when I open my eyes, I'm going to church. When we open up the Bible, we say, praise God, I have a chance to study the Word of God in silence and in peace. When was the last time we felt that way? Is it an obligation to come here? I'm not blaming all of you because I listen to my own sermon, and I'm guilty of that as well. Complacency is a deadly enemy to our spiritual growth. You know, last week I preached this message in Global. And that's the first time I was going to preach it. And I was thinking of 
this while I, on the car. And I said, I hope that they will get the message and, you know, live a Christ-like life. Before we go into global, I got into a fight with my wife. And I'm preaching this. Irony, huh? So this morning, I tried to avoid my wife for, <laughs> so that I won't be... But she's always quiet. She's always quiet. Now, we go to verse 19. This is a description of those that are enemies of the cross of Christ is. Their destiny is destruction. Talking about the enemies of Christ. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, this is talking about non-believers, but also applies to us if we are enemies of the cross of Christ. The destiny of the wicked, or those that don't believe in Jesus, is eternal death. We all know that. They go to hell. But we also have felt or will experience destruction. Not eternal, but still destruction. What do I mean? If we continue to become complacent, and we do whatever we want to do, we will have to face the consequences. It's okay to lie. It's the smallest of the sins. God will understand. And I'm a Christian anyway, so there's no repercussions. How many of you here have told a lie and then you got caught telling a lie? There's consequences. Friendship might be broken. Relationship will be strained. People won't trust you anymore. People won't believe what you say anymore. There are a lot of consequences to our sin. And we can, no one gets away with it. So to counter that, whenever you feel like sinning, no matter what your mindset is, small sin, big sin, Forgivable sin, unforgivable sin. When you feel the urge to sin, stop. Now, that will take you out of complacency because you need to pay attention to everything that you say, everything that you do, every facial expression that you make when you are interacting with other people. Sounds hard, and it is hard. Who says being a Christian is easy? We need to take care or take notice of even the smallest sins in our life. The next one is their God is their stomach. Talking about what we are into. We are into our own pleasure. The God of their stomach is the flesh. Nice analogy, right? Their God is the stomach. When, what is the function of a stomach? It's for us to digest the food that we eat. Have you ever heard, I'm sure you've heard of this. Where, symbolically, where do we kind of illustrate where God is in our life? It's in our heart, right? The Holy Spirit is in our heart. God is in my heart. I'm a believer. What does the heart do? It pumps blood all over our entire body. For what? to give us life. You lose the blood, you lose your life. How about the stomach? When you eat, it gathers the nutrients and, you know, spreads it or distributes it all over our body. Correct? Why did Paul use the analogy of a stomach for the bad things? Because we get hungry again. With the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we don't feel lacking in the Holy Spirit if by faith you continue to ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. But then the stomach gets hungry again and again and again. As far as I know, I'm not a doctor in the medical sense, but the heart doesn't pump anything toxic, right? The stomach does. You eat what you're not supposed to be eating, 
chicharon, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and merienda. Let's see how long you're going to stay alive. Being complacent also brings glory in their shame. What does that mean? If we are complacent in the way we live, we drag God's name along with us. If we don't pay attention to the way we act, the way we talk, we bring shame to God. And this glory in their shame means when somebody mentions your name, they remember the bad things that you did rather than the good. That is how people on this planet function. They see the bad in a lot of things. So when I say Billy Graham, what do you think about? Master evangelist, good preacher. When I say Ravi Zachariah, what do you think? He is a good apologetics. He's very good. He's very intellectual. But when, I, when you hear the name Ravi Zachariah now, what do you think of? We have to be careful with what, I, what you do. What if I say, Jun Go? Materialistic, worldly, can't get rid of his cars. Oh, I sold two. I promise you I will sell my cars. I sold two. What did you sell? I saw some people putting their Thanksgiving offering there. So maybe there's going to be a part two after this message. Then we are, in the Asian culture, we always want to protect our family name, correct? If we don't bear our cross, we're going to drag God's name in the mud along with us. And we don't want that to happen. Their mind is on earthly things. If we are complacent, we're going to buy stuff left and right. I should know. So when there's a shoppy sale, so when there's a piece of air, watch what you buy and watch what you yearn for. Complacency is a deadly enemy to our spiritual growth. We need to take it seriously. Notice the intensity of how Paul told the people to live. Next slide. I have often told you. Let's look at the word often told you. This is something that Paul keeps on reminding the Philippi believers. And when you see something important, you would say it more than once, right? If it's something that is not that important, not that serious, you can only say it once and leave it to the person whether he wants to do it or not. Like if you're a parent, dinner time, please wash your hands. You say that once, you sit down on the table, you don't check their hands, and everyone goes to eat. Did you play the piano? Five, five minutes. Did you play the piano? Five minutes. I didn't hear you playing your piano. That's often. But what if somebody tells you with tears? Why would somebody tell you something weeping? Because it's urgent. It's urgent. Guys, this is serious. We might not be deceived by false teachers, but we are being deceived by this world. We cannot be complacent. You may be saved, but in fact, you are guilty of doing more harm to the cause of Christ than good. Why would I say that? If we become complacent, we will do the things that we are not supposed to do. We get so numb to the fact that God forgave our sins that we continue sinning, and when we get addicted to sin, 
people will just, you know, have you ever heard people say, Christian ka pala, I didn't know you were a Christian. See? She's telling me that I'm not a Christian myself. Me. Living complacency destroys your life as an example of God's follower. And that does more harm than good. How do you live your life? Are you aware of the time that you have left? A couple of weeks from now, I'll be celebrating my 60th. Time is short. Because I, my condition, I don't see myself, I don't see death as a deadline for me. I also see my ineffectiveness as a deadline for me. You'll notice I kept on grabbing my hand because I'm starting to shake. Not out of nervousness, but I think the medicine's not working again. And as the day grew closer and closer, don't you think we should get more serious about our life in terms of God? So my mandate is to live, try to live for Christ every time that we open our eyes. Remember the song that we sang a while ago that everyone was so opening their mouth and singing? Every breath that I take, every moment that I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Or are we just lip singing, not being serious about what we were singing about? Now, what do we need to do? These are the tips. First is you need to know who you belong to. That's in verse 12. We belong to Christ and Him alone. Prior to be, being belong to God or to Christ is we are slaves of sin. Before knowing Christ, we are slaves of sin. When sin entices us before, we don't say no. We just do it because we are slaves. You, as a slave, you cannot say no to your master. And as you accepted Christ, you transfer your servitude to God. So you are slaves to sin, now you are slaves to God. My question is, why do we seldom disobey when we are the slaves of sin, and then we disobey when we are slaves of Christ? It doesn't have to be that way, right? If you are a slave of sin and you obey you should also obey when you're a slave of God. But we don't like it. We simply want to live our life just the way we want and to not pay attention to our master who is God himself. Next is forget about the past and strive for the future. This is Paul's the analogy using the runner on a race. When you are traveling in a car and you're driving within the speed limit, about 40 to 50, your field of vision is probably this wide. But as you drive faster, your focus narrows down to what's in front of you. You cannot run fast when you're looking back. What are you looking back at? The offense that was done to you by Christian? or non-Christians, your disappointments, people offended you, or even your past sins. People say you learn from history, but then we kind of slow down, actually, when we look behind us. We can also use our achievements to slow us down also. So being complacent means that you dwell in the past. What you need to do is forget the past and focus on the future. Because as you progress, you need to pay attention to it. Next is check your standards. This is easy to do. When you get home, you check who you are before and who you are right now. How many times did you read the Bible? per week. If before you do it five, now you do it seven, that's good. But if before it was five and now it's one or two, then something's wrong. 
So check your standards and recognize and follow. This is in verse 17 where Paul tells us to follow him. Now when he says follow him, that doesn't mean that he's perfect. That doesn't mean he has achieved his goal. That doesn't mean that he's arrogant, although he has a lot of credentials which would make him proud of himself. So what he's saying, especially, can you go to 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So what Paul is saying is, follow me in a sense of where in my life are examples of me following Christ. So when you set Paul as an example, you see which area in his life is living for Christ, you follow that one. Because Paul is a sinner like you and me. There will be incidents in his life, although if not listed in the Bible, I'm sure he has fallen down in sin once in a while. Like shouting at people, arguing, or something like that. You don't follow that, but you follow what he follows Christ for. And be careful of who you choose to follow. Because if you follow somebody, who he is will be who you will be. So what I do is, for me, I see, my, I see the weakness, the weak areas in my life, and I look at certain people to which I would follow. Now, when you choose people to follow, it's not only one. You choose somebody to set an example for temper, set an example for good time management or money management, set, look for an example of somebody who's prayerful. That I have. I have one for temper. I have one for prayer. I have one for devotion. And I have one for uh, preaching also. Verse 20, check your priorities. Who do we prioritize? Go home, see where your money is going to. Go home, check your calendar. We are to live for Christ. We are living for Him half a day. Let's do it one day. Let's start slowly. So for today when church is over, continue to praise God, continue to pray as a family. When you get into your car, start discussing. What did you learn in church? What are you going to share? That's how we do it. Then in verse 21. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they may be like his glorious body. This is death or rapture. What it means here is our striving for discipleship to become more Christ-like is not simply a destination. It's a process. It's a lifetime process. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy for you guys to get out of complacency, but we need to start. It's going to take years. Actually, we might not achieve pure, total Christ-likeness anytime, even in our lifetime. But we need to strive towards it. Why is this important? Because com being complacent will make us lose the war. We are called to be like Christ simply because we need to model Christ. We are citizens of heaven, not here. So as we end this message, I'd like, to everyone to I would like to encourage everyone to pray for me, to pray for each other. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you giving you praise and thanksgiving 
not only for the child dedication today, but also a chance for us to encourage each other to live for you. And as we do, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we may do this with victory and your glory in mind. Pray this in the mighty name of Christ. Amen and amen.